Every year, most people in the West Coast recognize that a big chunk of our rain comes from a few big storms, and we've discovered what we call atmospheric rivers because they're these narrow regions in the atmosphere where it's very moist and the winds are very strong, and those winds push that moisture along as water vapor, much like a river on land pushes water along as liquid. So in one atmospheric river at a given moment, it's transporting on average as much water vapor as 20 times the liquid water from the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. These are truly rivers of moisture in the atmosphere, and they represent just a few percent of the circumference of the Earth if you add them all up. Ongoing research into atmospheric rivers could play a pivotal role in the way Northern California prepares for winter storms and manages water supply. When they hit California or the West Coast, they often last about a day. We might get six to 10 in an average year. If we get fewer than that, we end up in drought. If we get more than that, we end up with flood risk. Precipitation transported by atmospheric rivers can account for one third to one half of California's annual water supply. This weather phenomenon has also contributed to all major Russian River floods since 1997. It only takes a few of these atmospheric rivers at any given time on the planet to transport almost all of the water vapor that is being moved around in the atmosphere. So they are really the engine of the global water cycle. And they are what make or break California precipitation. In the early 1860s, atmospheric rivers caused a statewide natural disaster in California. One of the most catastrophic floods in California occurred in the, well, in 1861-62. It rained heavily for 43 days. The precipitation was about three times the long-term average across the state. It was a series of atmospheric rivers with cascading effects because they followed one upon another so quickly against an already wet condition. There was quite a bit of snow in the Sierras and some of that melted. You had a huge runoff of, of water that ran down the rivers and filled the Sacramento Valley. So it literally turned the entire Sacramento Valley into an inland sea about 10 feet deep. It washed away farms, thousands of farms, and uh, so you had things like horses and cattle floating down toward San Francisco Bay. Sacramento had to be abandoned. Then Governor Leland Stanford had to go to his inauguration in a boat, and then had to relocate the capital to San Francisco uh, until the floodwaters drained. The state went into bankruptcy as a result of this flood. They've actually modeled this flood, a scenario called the Ark Storm, to see, well, what if this flood occurred today? How would it impact the state? How would we prepare for it? And what would happen? It'd be worse than the big earthquake if it should reoccur today. Some estimates have put the dollar damage somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 billion. I think an important part of understanding atmospheric rivers is in the predictive power of that, being able to forecast it and prepare people, mitigate the impacts. California deploys four unique atmospheric river observatories to identify and monitor atmospheric rivers as they make landfall. One is located in Bodega Bay, but early monitoring begins over the Pacific Ocean. Because these storms, these atmospheric rivers typically come from over the ocean to the west coast, we need to measure them over the ocean, and that will help give us lead time of a day or two or three as we try to anticipate the details of where and when an atmospheric river might hit the coast. The observations we use primarily for atmospheric rivers are satellite-based. It just paints out this beautiful, long, narrow region of concentrated water vapor. However, that's not the whole story. We can have a lot of water vapor and it can have a shape that looks like an atmospheric river, but maybe the winds are weak. So one thing we've started doing the last few years is taking research aircraft from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, from NASA, uh, from the Air Force, and going out and measuring these storms in terms of their winds. In meteorology, airborne reconnaissance for storms has been done for decades for hurricanes for the East Coast, or for nor'easters if you're in New England. For the West Coast, this is the type of storm that warrants that kind of observation, and we're inventing today. 
with the National Weather Service and others how to do this. So many decisions are made every day based on weather forecasts, whether it's going to be dry or hot or wet or windy. So many things from energy to water to people's daily activities to transportation are affected by weather prediction. The better we understand the phenomena that we're trying to predict, the better we're going to be able to predict them.